Good afternoon, everybody, the dignitaries, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we, are, we are sort of now going to, for the next, uh, I'd say, many minutes, because uh, I'm going to try to sort of give you an overview of the document that is going to then subsequently be released by, by these great, uh, wonderful scientific dignitaries who are with us this, this, this morning and this afternoon. Um, so essentially, this is trying to give you a sense of technology roadmap education. And uh, as has already been said, this is anchored very much in, in, in the understanding, a prior understanding we had of the main document, the main vision document, of which, uh, as uh, has been mentioned, uh, I, was, I was one of the co-authors. And the point, I think it's really important that we should understand that, is that this is not a prediction exercise. In other words, we are not saying this is what is likely to happen. Uh, this is not a foresight exercise. Uh, it's not that this is what we can envisage. It is not even a projection exercise in that, you know, given uh, where we are, this is where we will be. What it is, is a vision exercise. And a vision exercise is really saying, this is where we would like to be. So uh, we were very clear when we were writing the main document that that is what we were doing. And therefore, there was always a danger. The danger was that this would be all completely airy-fairy stuff. So that was a challenge, always, sort of, you know, to have the head in the clouds, but the feet firmly planted on the ground. And trying to, trying to do that at all times is sort of what created, really resulted in all of the creative tension in the process by which the main document was written. Now, as has been pointed out, there are 12 sectors uh, in all that are being focused on. Uh, we are concerned today with uh, sector 10, which is education. Education was not covered in the Technology Vision 2020. So this is the one sector which is in fact new. It also tells us, I think, something about how our national priorities have evolved. That when Technology Vision 2020 was being written, we still aren't in the year 2020. It was not thought that there needed to be a specific sectoral focus on education. Today, you can't conceive of an exercise like this uh, without sort of having education as a sector. And I think that says some really ultimately wonderful things about the way we have evolved uh, as a country. Uh, this, this graphic has already been shown to you, uh, the, the, the prerogatives. Again, I'd like to point out that one of the prerogatives pertains entirely to uh, this sector, which is quality education, livelihood, and creative opportunities. In other words, that every one of the six individual prerogatives that every Indian has is the right, and we're using here the, the language of rights, the right to quality education, livelihood, and creative opportunities. So this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is the vision uh, of uh, the, uh, the education technology roadmap. It's a very simple vision, but we believe a very profound one. I hope those of you sitting up can read those letters down there, which is achieving the full potential of every Indian. That is it. Achieving the full potential of every Indian. We have to have an education system that makes that happen. One of the, uh, now I'm going to just go through with you ever so briefly over the sections of which this, this document is comprised. So we start off by focusing on the historical significance of the year 2035 from an education perspective. And the significance is related to this man. For those of you who don't recognize him, you should, because this man has impacted on our country like few other human beings have. Thomas Babington Macaulay, who on the 2nd of February, 1835, namely two centuries ago, enunciated a minute on education and one of the most celebrated lines in this whole minute is this. We must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern. A class of persons, Indian in blood and color, but English in tastes, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. So for us, right from the beginning, this document, among other things, was about challenging this vision. It was, it was challenging this understanding of education built by imperial power to serve its interests of control and extraction. And how can we now rethink, really literally from first principles, what sort of education system 
we need if we are going to be a country that is itself a system-shaping power in the years to come. In other words, a great power ourselves. That, in some ways, was our challenge. And that is the way in which we sort of took the whole thing. That we, got to, we can't talk about technology before we talk about the education system itself. So as I said, the historic significance of, uh, of 2035, two centuries from Macaulay, the minute on education, for better or worse, has determined the content methodology of what is being taught in Indian educational institutions and the medium of instruction through which these have and continue to be taught. So let us not for a moment imagine that sort of Macaulay is history. Macaulay is hardwired, deeply embedded in our entire education system. And I think we need to understand that. We need to understand, more importantly, the significance of that. Uh, and then sort of you know, plan and strategize based on that understanding. So for us, this was a goal and an opportunity. This exercise gave us an opportunity to assess where we are and would be in terms of both education and technology. It gave us an opportunity to capitalize, uh, to think afresh and aloud, to draw the contours of an education system befitting India in the year 2035. We then go on to the second section, which is looking at the landscape uh, of, of, of education in, in contemporary India. Uh, I will not say very much about this because this is just looking at, at sort of current data. But, uh, but in fact, I scribbled some of this. Excuse me, I think I've left it. Just about three bits of data to give you a sense of where we are as a system. These are really snapshots. You know, there are 3.4 crores learners. And in this document, we try not to use the word student. We work very hard. Sometimes we can't avoid the term student because, you know, student teacher ratio, for example, technically. But we try to use the term learner throughout. Uh, there are 3.4 crore learners in the entire tertiary system, from the undergraduate degree up to the PhD in all branches of learning, 3.4 crores. And there are 25.9 crore learners in everything from kg to 12. So just imagine, 26 crore youngsters, the success of Sarva Siksha Abhiyan, where are they going to be accommodated? We simply do not have a tertiary system remotely large enough to accommodate this vast mass of learners who, for the first time in our history, are going to now, all of them, expect at least a first degree, a first university degree, as a matter of right. Think about another bit of data. We are now graduating six times as many engineers as there are jobs for them. But it's a problem that's bidirectional because there's a recent study, a 2017 study, that involves such distinct players as CII and AICT and the UN. Uh, UND, uh, UNDP and so on and so forth. And what do they say? They say that only 40% of the pass-outs from our tertiary system are actually employable. So, so not enough jobs for those who want them, and those who want sort of people for their jobs don't find the people who are being produced adequate. So it's a bi-directional problem of enormous magnitude. Uh, think about this. You know, uh, in all, in all, uh, there are today 35% of high school students, 20% of undergraduates, and 13% of postgraduates are in some form of tuition or coaching. Some form of tuition or coaching. The private tuition industry in our country today has an annual turnover, it is estimated, of 4.2 lakh crores. And just to put this in perspective, the entire resources being put into all levels of education by the union and all the state governments combined is about 4.08 lakh crores. So we've got a private tuition industry that actually is in fiscal terms today larger than all of the public monies going into every level and every branch of education. If this is not a wake-up call for us, then we are, in a way, I'm sorry to say, comatose, uh, permanently. You know, uh, we've, we've really got to begin to understand where this private coaching industry originates from. We've got to understand it originates partly from the 
the, the scarcity of institutions of higher learning. Some branches have way more institutions than are needed, like engineering. And there are other branches where there are way fewer. We have only 66,000 medical seats in, for which you have about 14 lakh aspirants in a country that we all recognize is underserviced when it comes to public health and medicine. So what, 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 what are we doing? What have we designed? I think, I think this, is, this is some of the things that we discuss in this section. Then we discuss the Indians, who are going to be these Indians in 2035. What are their ed educational aspirations? What we do is we, we look at, first of all, the data. And uh, you know, these are UN uh, figures. Uh, basically, uh, we, we estimate that by 2035, uh, there would be 1.46 billion Indians. That's the median figure. The medium figure uh, is, is, sorry, in fact, 1.57 million. 1.46 is the low figure for 2035. So basically, one thing is very clear from these data, which is India is and will remain a country of immense size. But the other point which these data do not capture is that India is and will remain a country of immense diversity. So we are not like our big neighboring country to the north of us. And by the way, another thing we do in this document is we do not mention any other country or any other education system. We don't, we don't sort of you know, talk about what the wonderful thing that the Finns are doing and the, this thing that is happening there. This is all very interesting as general ideas. But we say we've got to figure this out from first principles as a bunch of Indians thinking about India. So that country to the north of us, as large as us, but nowhere near as diverse as us. So you can have a kind of a, you know, one size fits all solution there. You can't have it in India. That's the other thing. The certitude of massive diversity. That's the only thing about the future that we can be certain about. That we are massive and we are diverse. So therefore, right at the beginning we said that this document, this technology roadmap was not so much about India in 2035, but Indians in 2035. Not a landscape, but a peoplescape. It is therefore, to some extent, also a, an exercise in taxonomy. And we're trying to ask, you know, to what extent would circumstances or structure determine these categories? And what would be the role of choice or agency in the making of these categories? So what are these categories? The first of them, you've already seen some of them mentioned, uh, rooted and remote. The second category we call globalized and diaspora. I will not get into the details of what are the attributes of these categories because, you know, frankly, they'll take way too much time. Category three, we have what we call dropouts and late bloomers. This is a category which is not there in the main document, but it's very germane when it comes to education. This person, by the way, is the, is the great French artist Paul Cezanne, uh, who in a way, I think, exemplifies the problem of the late bloomer. He's a very, very important figure in the history of art. He bridges the 19th and the 20th centuries in terms of sort of, you know, uh, Western art and so on and so forth. Cezanne was a late bloomer. I mean, through most of his life, nobody recognized him for what he was. Only towards the last years of his life that he really, truly became, came into his own and became a great artist. And one of our problems is we have a system which is extremely harsh on those who are forced to drop out, those who sort of discover their talents late in life. The fourth category, sadly, it is going to remain even in 2035 as a very significant part of our population are left out or left behind. Then we have, unfortunately, we were not able to get an Indian picture for this no matter how much we looked for it. Second chances or double dips. Either those who dropped out the first time who want another shot at getting into the education system or those who so things went well for them the first time around. But in a society now, uh, you know, our demographic profile is shifting in a longer living and aging society. Those who are elderly, who've already sort of, as it were, left the, their, their principal job of occupation or profession, are still going to be active for two or three decades after that. And they want to be a part of the system. They want to contribute. Do we have an education system that can provide for them? So this is going to become a very important category. Then, uh, then Dr. Prabhat Ranjan mentioned uh, this category, the sadhus, etc. Those in our country who will always have alternate lifestyles and worldviews. And we need to think, can an education system cater for them? Finally, the last two categories, what we call creative, innovative, and imaginative. And finally, of course, those who lie behind any productive process, 
that keep any country, any economy going, the beehives and your production lines. What we do uh, is we, we tell 12 stories because we could capture the diversity, in, uh, the, 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 the size in data, but to capture the diversity, we had to actually tell stories. So there are these 12 Indians, all fictional characters, and we, through those very short stories, try to explain what the diversity of educational needs are for, for Indians today. And then through the rest of the document, there are another eight Indians whose stories from time to time we tell to illustrate a particular kind of situation or problematic. Literacy, creativity, and skills. Uh, this is one of, uh, we think, uh, the original contributions that we have made in this document. We argue that we need to have a completely different understanding now of what literacy is. Uh, and it's, you know, so we, we actually say it's now has to have at least five components to it, reading, writing, and communication, numeracy, e-digital e proficiency, visual and symbolic proficiency, and civic awareness. And that all of these are going to be core elements of literacy. So literacy is no longer about being able to read and write in a particular language and certain basic numeracy. Literacy, in fact, we have to see in much wider terms. In fact, an elderly person who no longer can manipulate devices is in that sense functionally illiterate. That's the point. They, they may in fact have a PhD uh, in Sanskrit literature, but you know, if they've not kept up with technology, they can find themselves beginning to be left out. So literacy is about that. Lit literacy is about the extent to which you, know, you are left out of formal and informal systems and networks because of certain incapacities that you have. And so for us, all five of these elements are critical to a 2035 understanding of literacy. And we're very grateful to those of our colleagues on the, on the advisory committee who actually came up with this, because a fair amount of thought and original work went into this. And they also came up with what we are calling the literacy wheel. So all these elements of literacy then are as if, as if in the center of the wheel. And this wheel then, as you can see, has got spokes that really are, go from everything from traditional skills to higher studies, from e-marketing to vocational studies, from, uh, you know, from, uh, from training service to credited courses, and they're all serving on the rim from the public sector, uh, the se public sector needs, corporate sector needs, we're creating enabled citizens, self-employment, entrepreneurship, livelihood, dignity, empowerment, and academia. So these are all the purposes to which ultimately, and for us, creativity, creativity is critical in all of this. In fact, in this section, we argue that we cannot have literacy without creativity. That creativity and literacy are, in fact, part of that same continuum. And, these, and creativity, we think, is in some ways the connecting tissue that connects all of this. And technology, then, for us, is the lubricant. Technology is the lubricant that will make this wheel uh, run smoothly. The, the next section is on access. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very strong section, but it's very difficult for me to say very much about it. Uh, we, we talk about all of the problems of access and so on and so forth. Um, then we have a, a section on uh, what we call mainstreaming vocational education and reimagining lifelong learning. So for us, the challenge is not just mainstreaming vocational education, but also, as it were, vocationalizing what we call mainstream education. To some extent, it's about getting skills in. To some extent, it's, it's getting that balance that we have, which is completely imbalanced today between knowledge and skills. Knowledge and skills are ultimately, obviously interconnected. That goes without saying. For every bit of knowledge, there's an associated skill and vice versa. But ultimately, knowledge, know what, is what we have privileged in our education systems to the cost of skills, which is know-how. And so getting that balance between know what and know how is critical for us. We think that when it comes to the vocational sector, these are the four core challenges, content development, faculty training, involvement of industry in imparting skills, and accreditation and quality assurance. These are all distinct problems, and we need to tackle all of them distinctly. Obviously, they interconnect. But each of them, in a way, is a, is a problem which needs to be tackled in and of itself. There are a number of different design and development strategies for vocational education and training, uh, VET schools and so on. I'll not go into this, but this is very much a part of the document that I hope you will get a chance to look at. And we also look at a whole bunch of vocational education parameters, strategic themes, learning areas, learning focused domain, assessment, desired outcomes, and so on. 
And when it comes to lifelong learning, what we argue is lifelong learning depends fundamentally both on new content as well as innovation in delivery. The problem about lifelong learning quite simply is this. How can someone be a learner without exiting the world of work? That's the challenge. You know, if you exit the world of work, you can always re-enter the world of learning. But that's not lifelong learning. You're just coming back to the education system. Here we are asking, how can you continue to have access to learning while remaining in the world of work? Because until you can crack this problem, there are lots of people who may want to re-engage with the world of learning who cannot simply because they've got to put food on the family table every day. It's as simple as that. So, so therefore, we need innovation in delivery for them, and we also need to think about new content for them. Now, some of this desire for lifelong learning is driven by quality of life concerns. Somebody is retired, you know, and they, they, they just want to do something else. You know, they, they were pushed into engineering, their real passion was history. You know, now that they've finished the thing, now they want to get into, they really want to study history. You know, so that's one form of it. But the other is actually livelihood driven. And livelihood driven, again, we say, could involve reskilling. That's when you say, base, when you're staying basically in the same sector, but you sort of now need to get a new set of skills because technology has moved on, so on and so forth. But it could also be re educating, that you may well be wanting to leave one sector and enter another sector, in which case it's not just a question of skills, and you need to get a whole bunch of new knowledge as well. So it's, it's actually, therefore, when you think about lifelong learning in these ways, as we've tried to, it does, in fact, become a very complex problem in and of itself. Then there's, of course, the whole question of quality. Um, just one graphic here, there are many, but this is just sort of laying out, uh, and this is, again, uh, original work done by, by one of our colleagues that we are very proud of and grateful for. Um, essentially about what the current scenario is with regards to evaluation for certification. And I won't go into all of this, but I can assure you each one of these, these circles, as it were, has been very deeply thought of and you know, has involved a lot of a lot of brainstorming and sort of trying to figure out things out. Because until we find what the deficiencies are with regards to our evaluation processes and assessment processes, we're not really going to be able to crack the problem. And you know, certification is fundamentally linked to all of that. Uh, then we have a, a section which focuses on employability, entrepreneurship, and livelihood security. I'll not say anything more about that, it's, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's critical. Um, and we even out here look at it in generational terms, the so-called Generation Z that is coming up, namely people who, are, who will in 2035 be between the ages of 25 and 45. That's the critical group. They are going to be the ones who are going to be really driving the productive process in our country in the year 2035. And General Z comes with very particular characteristics. Uh, you know, it's the first generation in India that's actually been raised by parents who wanted to be friends with them, you know? Uh, no other generation in India ever had that problem before, that their parents knew that they were their parents, you know? I mean, and you could become friendly with your parents after, you know, after the daughter was married, and you know? Then you could go and say, okay, fine, now, you know, the grandkids on the way, now we can be friends. But it was a, there was a distance, and it was a, it was a part, it was, it, was, it was deeply cultural. It is deeply cultural for people of my generation and older than me, but gen Generation Z doesn't understand that. They've not been raised that way, they've been raised to be, you know, like your, your, your dad and your mom is your best friend, mommy, mommy, abba, the best friends, all that stuff. So that leads to certain kind of things. So you know, we, we spend some time sort of thinking about that. Then we have a section on culture, recreation, and the good life. Um, we define the good life in the following ways. We say that the good life essentially involves uh, one, uh, you know, uh, being a good individual, a good human being. Secondly, being a good citizen being a worthy member of the political community to which one belongs, and third, being a good global citizen, namely a good inhabitant of the planet. That you, you need to, to, a good life encompasses all of these dimensions. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and attaining the good life is something that we all as human beings, in a way, aspire to. We then try to link the good life to both sports as well as culture. And, and we sort of, we, we argue, we suggest that Sports and culture are two ways by which we can, in our education system, attain the good life. And you know, if we, if we get sports and culture really into our system in such a way that we do not see mathematics as being inherently superior to dancing, for example. That you know, we, we treat mathematics and dance as both being important. 
and we don't treat a child who's gravitating towards dance as somehow in some ways being, being deficient or inferior to the child who's good at mathematics is gravitating towards mathematics. That's the challenge. And it's very difficult because it comes with a whole bunch of social and, and cultural sort of norms and so on and so forth. Then we have a section on research, innovation, and product development. Uh, uh, you know, uh, a very nice section, as, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Goswami has already said, uh, our chairman, Dr. Anil Kakotkar, had a lot to do with this section. In fact, we, we, you know, we tinkered with the words and you know, did, did stuff to it, but basically the core ideas in this section, I dare say, are still pretty much his ideas. And so I would urge you to read it. It's, it's really, really a short but very well, uh, well articulated section, in my opinion. Then we come to what really is for us the main part of this uh, technology roadmap, which is the technological future of education. So, so where does technology fit in all of this? We've been looking at a whole bunch of different issues. Okay, so what's the technology in it? And what we did was we clustered it around categories of technologies. So obviously starting off with ICT, then artificial intelligence, uh, then display and user interface technologies, a whole bunch of them, then internet technologies, computational technologies, and finally simulation and modeling technologies. And we, and, and in all, there are about 32 technologies that we have focused on. We've defined what each of these technologies are, uh, and we've, we've, we've given, tried to give examples of how these technologies can be deployed in education, and in what ways they will fundamentally impact on education in a fundamental sense, in what ways will they transform education. Then we have, and by the way, I must say something about these section uh, uh, dividers, uh, you know, uh, a lot of my colleagues on the uh, advisory committee are very unhappy with them. So we've promised them that even after the document release, we'll, we'll see if we can do something with them. But, uh, you know, documents like this are always produced under a deadline. So, you know, uh, so this is what was available and this is what we went with. But then we have a section called Emerging Knowledge Scapes and Institutional Architectures. Uh, we felt that we couldn't, in a document like this, not talk about knowledge itself and ask about what are the types of institutions in which knowledge is going to be located, the types of institutions in which knowledge is going to be created, the types of institutions that are going to be fundamental in the dissemination of knowledge and, of course, the associated skills in, in the coming years. And so in this chapter, uh, in this section, what we try to do is, among other things, for example, we say that there used to be a mode A, uh, in, when the way we approached questions of science and questions of knowledge in, in a broader sense. You know? So for instance, you know, organizations used to, tr 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 to usually be both hierarchical and in a way form preserving. That means once you set up a university, it will last forever. You know? So universities don't die, people do. You know? Professors die, universities don't die. You know? That kind of thing. Though if you're a JNU professor, who knows? Because I suspect that soon superannuation for JNU professors will be 75. So. Some of us joke that they're going to have to now build a crematorium on JNU campus to <laughs> just sort it all out in one go. But anyway, the point is, that's the way organizations used to be. Now, organizations we are seeing, the best organizations, the organizations that are best, both at producing knowledge and at transmitting it, are in some ways hierarchical and transient. In other words, they, they don't have this kind of sense of permanence to it. You know, I mean, for instance, PIFAC itself, in some ways, you know, uh, a think tank, you know, a think tank uh, on technology embedded within government. You know, there's a lot of knowledge being created there, but it's not something that you would traditionally have recognized as a knowledge-creating institution. So in some ways, the, we are not saying that mode one types of institutions will disappear, but in the future, it's going to be a much more complicated ecosystem, a much more complicated landscape, if you will. We're going to have mode one institutions and mode two institutions. Uh, mode one institutions are important. Why? Because tradition is important. And particularly if you're a university vice chancellor, I spend all my time saying this, you know, innovation is really important, but so is tradition. And, and our whole job is in fact trying to marry tradition and innovation, you know, uh, and doing it in ways that ultimately are socially productive uh, and, you know, cognitively and pedagogically productive. That's the challenge, but we've got to bring them together. So mode one institutions cannot disappear. I mean, you know, Savitri Bhai, Pule Pune Vidya Peet is not going to disappear. It's going to continue to be there. But what we are saying is institutions like this, like my universities, all, all of us are going to face a very fundamental challenge now because the field is not going to be consisting just of us. 
is going to be consisting of a lot of newcomers. We may call them within quotes as upstarts, but they're there and they're functioning. And sometimes if we are honest, in some areas they're actually functioning better than we are. You know, some would argue that in all areas, I would disagree with that, but in some areas they're functioning better than us. So those are the challenges. How do we marry mode A, mode, mode one and mode two, for example? Those sorts of issues. And there are, there are plenty of other issues. We look at the question of traditional knowledge systems versus uh, you know, a more modern knowledge systems. We, uh, we look at the whole you know, interdisciplinary divide and, and, you know, and uh, we ask what kind of transdisciplinarity is emerging. We argue that in fact bio, uh, you know, biochemistry is not a good example uh, because that kind of you know, emergence of a new field of learning essentially is not going to be really the model. The new model is going to be really in some ways in you know, the sciences of complexity. Uh, perhaps, you know, where you're getting people from a whole bunch of different areas, or the cognitive sciences, where you have people from, from brain research, you know, from, well, everything really, from, you know, uh, from neurons to storytelling, you know. I mean, you know, everybody sort of fits in somewhere when, when thinking about the cognitive sciences. So we, we argue in this, in this section, it's a somewhat densely argued section, but we couldn't make it too lightweight because we were discussing fairly dense things. But, but, but uh, you know, we, we would suggest that. Then we have a section which is uh, shaping and enabling an environment for knowledge and skills. And I'll sum this up in just one sentence. We argue that there are three fundamental pillars that are going to shape an enabling environment. And these pillars are finance, infrastructure, and policy. So we can talk till the, you know, till for a long, long time about technology and the rest of it. But unless we look at these three pillars systematically as well, the finance pillar, the infrastructure pillar, and the policy pillar, uh, we are not really going to be able to shape an enabling environment for knowledge and skills. And we then sort of try to bring this all together at the end uh, in this table where we try to link what we've been saying, some of the core areas, culture, recreation, and the good life, literacy, creativity, and skills, access, lifelong learning, testing, evaluation, and certification, with the types of Indians we talk about at the beginning of the document, rooted and remote, global diaspora, dropouts and late bloomers, et cetera. So we try to sort of build this table and then we try to look at, well, you know, what are the sorts of technologies that we think are going to sort of be very useful for this particular type of need for this group of Indians. So that's the sort of a mapping exercise that we have done. And that's sort of we hope sort of in a way will towards the end of the document, the reader who's going through it from cover to cover will begin to think that, okay, all these things, diverse things that I'm talking about ultimately are getting tied together. And there is technology at the heart of it. I mean, this is ultimately is a technology roadmap and we're well aware of that. We end, and I'm literally at, I'm literally at my last uh, couple of uh, slides, so please bear with me, you've been very patient. But we really set out five grand challenges. And I'm literally in the last couple of slides. One. I, I'm going to finish this. I was up till 5.30 in the morning today after taking a terrible three hours and 45 minute drive from Mumbai to Pune on your so-called expressway uh, after having flown from Goa to Mumbai. So, you know, I've, I've suffered and I've done... So I'm, I'm, I'm finishing this, but I promise you I'll not detain you for very much longer. And this is important. This is the last thing. And, you know, ultimately, we feel we need to lay out certain grand challenges for the system. The first grand challenge we think is enabling universal personalized access to knowledge and skills in a dialogic teaching learning environment. And I think every word in this has meaning. We got to use technology. We got to use technology uh, to sort of begin to transmit knowledge and skills, which has to be individualized. That's one of the problems that we've, you know, early on in our, in our, in our, in our exercise, we said if we were to sum up the entire problem of the Indian education system across all levels and across all branches of learning, in a single phrase, what would that phrase be? And we brainstormed about this uh, a lot. And then uh, one of my distinguished colleagues who was then working at the NCRT said that, well, I think I have the phrase, and that is predetermined content. If there is one single bane of our system, it is predetermined content. Somebody else decides what the learner will learn. And that somebody else ultimately is and educational slash academic bureaucrat. And that's the problem. And today, in the past, the learner didn't have a choice. Today, the learner has a choice. The learner can just either physically walk out of your classroom in those 
universities that allow it and don't have minimum attendance requirements for exams. Uh, and those were the things, they will just mentally lock, walk out. You know? They'll walk out mentally. They'll be physically there, but they'll be doing other things. So today, but, it, but, this, but this has got to be a dialogical process. It cannot be just about you know, a machine, as it were, giving things to the learner. Because learning takes place always in dialogue. You, there are questions, and in the first session today, in pre-lunch session, there was some wonderful work being done about how you create, begin through, through machines, through technology, build that dialogic process. But we think that that's a grand challenge, and that's, that's something that we need to tackle. Secondly, this is something which is very dear to all of us, enabling language-neutral content through real-time translation and interpretation, genuinely. The example I give is that a learner sitting in Vasco, in, in my state of Goa, a learner sitting in Vasco should be able to hear a lecture being delivered in organic chemistry in German in Heidelberg. And to be able to hear it in Konkani. That's the challenge. It's possible. Today, we are on the cusp of the technologies that will make that happen. That will transform everything. So I say this when I go around my colleges. I say, you know, understand that the relationship between teacher and learner is changing drastically. And tomorrow your learner will just migrate to another better teacher somewhere. And language will no longer be a barrier. And it's going to be cheap. It's not going to cost more than an average telephone bill. So that's, that's a challenge. How do we make this happen? Third, building universal interactive and adaptive simulators for skill training and evaluation. I think this is actually a huge engineering hardware and software challenge. Because if we are serious about skills, one of the problems with the way we impart skills is that it is done really in very much still today the guru shishya kind of way, which is you have an instructor, the instructor teaches you skills, skills get better the more you practice, 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 practice. The better you pra more you practice, the better you get at it. But with this vast number of learners we are talking about entering our system, that the, it, it was simply not going to be able to do it unless we bring technology in. So we are saying we need to have simulators that help the learners to practice, practice, practice on those skills, whatever those skills may be. But here's the thing. Educational institutions in our country are not going to be able to, to actually get serious about this unless there were cheap simulators available. You know, I mean, uh, a, a, a simulator for, for a commercial aircraft costs more than a commercial aircraft, you know, which is why you have so many commercial aircraft and so few simulators. And why, you know, you have, you have a month and a half of booking if you want to, you know, you have to, so a commercial airline pilot has to go back on simulators to, to get back their certification or to keep their certification up. They need to book for it. Why? It's because they're so expensive. So that's the technology challenge. It's a hardware plus software challenge. It's an engineering challenge. We've got to basically have a common rig. And on that rig, you've got in a modular way be able to attach pieces of hardware and the associated software to make something happen. And then that can be dismantled and something else can be put out there. And that basic rig has got to be really, really fairly cheap. There can be two or three models, perhaps different firms may have different models, et cetera, which institutions can purchase. And then on need, they can go and buy, you know, whatever has to be the add-on that you can attach to that rig in order for it. So the same rig can be used for a whole range of different things. We write about this in the document. Please take a look at it. Integrating diverse knowledge systems, academic specializations, and levels of learning. I'll not say anything more about this, but it's, it's a core, it's a core a grand challenge as we see it. And the fifth grand challenge is replacing individual certification and institutional ranking with reputation metrics and quality assurance. Because reputation metrics are really what we need. You know, this inspector's coming to your university to assess whether you're an A-plus university or not. You know, you can, you can set everything up beautifully when the inspectors are there. The worst result of it is all our learners, all our students are constantly learning for the next examination. So that's it. So, so the whole learning is focused on clearing that exam. That's the only thing the focus is on. That's completely perverse. It completely messes up the system. So how can we do that? In, you know, different types of reputation metrics. Today, big data analytics makes this possible. It, it becomes possible for us to begin to think about what some of those reputation metrics would be for individuals, for institutions, and so on. And then there are two other challenges which we list, literally mentioned at the bottom of our document. 
Neither of them, we feel, has a very strong technology component to it, but we think that these two grand challenges round off the other five, which clearly are very technology heavy. One is bridging the divide between curricular, co-curricular, and non-curricular learning. Beginning to recognize that learning is learning, curriculum is artificial. And, and academic bureaucrats decide what is curricular and what is not curricular, and that needs to change. But it's a huge challenge in terms of policy, et cetera. And the last, and we think a doc technology document must end on this note, making teacher training the keystone of educational reform. Because particularly in a world in which technology is galloping, we've got to keep training and retraining teachers. In fact, one of the things we say in our, uh, this is literally my last point in, in the document is, we feel if there's one area in the education system which should be ring-fenced off from the private sector, which should purely be a public sector preserve, that is teacher training. We actually make a, we make a brief, we don't say very much about it, but we do have at least a paragraph which makes an, a suggestion that teacher training is so important that teacher training is something that should actually be a responsibility of the public sector that getting any profit motive into it actually messes up the system in very disastrous ways. I'm so sorry, Mr. Chairman, for having carried on so long. I'm done. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you for the